Uh, hello, my name is Ores Kardopoulis and I'm really happy to be presenting this joint work with Mirko Dorling and Julie Malavolta titled Rate 1 Quantum Free Homomorphic Encryption. Uh, first off, I'm going to start with some introduction about everything that I just mentioned in the title, uh, starting with for the homomorphic encryption or FHC scheme, which is basically a, an encryption scheme that allows Alice to encrypt some message N such that later Bob, holding an arbitrary function f, can compute the encryption of f1. In other words, uh, we want for Bob to be able to perform computations over encrypted data without first having to decrypt the original message. Now, this is very interesting in the setting where we have a weaker client that wants to outsource computations to a more powerful server. And that's why in the figure we have Clark Kent, who is supposed to be the weaker client, and Superman, who is the more powerful server. Um, of course, in a saying like this, we want to achieve security. And uh, first of all, we want semantic security, which means that we want for Alice's uh, message M to be hidden at all times. Or in other words, we want Bob or the server to not be able to tell apart encryption of, of two different messages, M0 and M1. Now, apart from security for Alice or the client, we also want security for Bob which comes in the form of circuit privacy. Uh, that means that we want for cl the client or Alice to not get any information about the circuit or fraction used for the computation. Uh, now, when talking about circuit privacy, we can refer either to the weaker notion of semi owner circuit privacy, where circuit privacy holds only for well-informed messages from Alice, or we can refer to the stronger notion of malicious circuit privacy, where it holds for any arbitrary message from Alice. Now, uh, in this paper from Ostrovsky et al., they actually showed a way to compile any classical FHC, which is semi on the circuit private, into a malicious circuit private one. Uh, okay. Now, Apart from security, we also want to achieve efficiency, especially if we opt to use these uh, schemes in real-life systems. And what happens is, because of security reasons, the message from the server to the client uh, is bigger. So there is a communication overhead introduced, and we want that to not be, not be too big so as to nullify the efficiency of outsourcing the computations in the first place. And that's why communication complexity is of very high interest, and we want for communication complexity to be compact. And that means to be independent of the size of the circuit used for the uh, computation. And if that's true, then the communication overhead is not too big, and we can use it in uh, applications such as security evaluating function, or in encrypted databases, such as in private information retrieval, where we retrieve an item from a database without revealing which one. And yeah. So uh, the best communication complexity of an FHC uh, was introduced in this paper by Brokeski and Al, where it approaches that of the insecure protocol, where Alice would just send her message in plain. So we have an asymptotically optimal FHC here. Now, uh, as a metric for communication complexity, we're going to use rate which is basically the message to ciphertext ratio. But if you want to get a bit more technical, it's the size of the uh, encrypted uh, data in plane over the size of the homomorphically evaluated data under encryption. Now, we want the rate to be uh, as big as possible because we want the homomorphically evaluated data to be as small as possible. And uh, when we refer to rate 1 schemes, we refer to schemes that asymptotically approach rate equal to 1. Uh, such as the one adopted uh, before from Broker's data. Now, what happens if we move to the quantum setting? Of course, we also have quantum uh, for form of encryption schemes, and it's basically the same notion, but here we have, instead of a classical message, we have a quantum state psi. And both the client and the server can be quantum. And of course, instead of a function, we have a unitary matrix because 
in order to perform quantum computations, you have to do that with a hint or a Now, uh, maskless is known for the quantum setting, but in our opinion, it's even more important due to the large gap between quantum uh, capabilities of regular users and servers on the cloud in the future. Uh, and the more important, um, the more interesting case here is why we have a quantum output, because the classical output, maybe we can use classical techniques to um, to store it uh, optimally and get rate one, but uh, if we have a, a quantum output, again, massless is not for the quantum setting. So this is exactly the question we pose, uh, if we can get a rate one uh, secure quantum FAT, and the result is yes, that's exactly what we construct. So we get a quantum FAT in the malicious setting with optimal communication complexity. And in order to do that, we do it with a combination of two main technical steps. First, we construct a maliciously circuit private quantum FAT, and then we construct a rate one quantum FAT. Now, uh, these results, they can be of their of independent interest, but they're also compatible with each other, so we can combine them and get our main result. Now, um, before getting into any actual construction or paper, I need to talk about some existing quantum free homomorphic encryption scheme and techniques that we're going to use. And I want to start with some intuition about why we can use classical methods and the methods of classical encryption schemes and just extend them into the quantum setting and why this is not trivial and one of the reasons is interference so in quantum computations interference is very important and what it means is that elements of the superposition representing the same bit string but with opposite amplitudes they cancel out and to make this more evident i'm going to use an example and I'm going to focus on the Hanover transformation. Now, this is a quantum transformation, a quantum computation. And here you can see the Hanover transformation with input kit 0 and here with kit 1. With this symbol kit, we symbolize qubits. And the actual result is not too important, but what I want to focus on is that if we apply the Hanover transformation onto this superposition, and we replace the Hanover of 0, kit 0, and Hanover of kit 1, we get this result. <clears throat> and here we have k1 and we have minus k1 where these are qubits with the same bit string but opposite amplitude so they cancel out and the result is k0 and that thing is really important for quantum computations now what happens if we had encryptions and we use classical methods for this uh, the result would look kind of like this but what happens is that in classical encryptions we have probabilistic encryptions, which means that its bit has many different, can have many different encryptions. So this ket encryption of 1 and this ket of encryption 1, uh, they're not the same, and thus they cannot cancel each other, so interference will not work. So that's why we cannot just use classical techniques. Now in order to circumvent that problem, we use the quantum one time pi. Now, the quantum one pad is similar, a similar notion to the classical one pad, but instead of using a string and extracting it with our uh, message, we use these Pauli operators, which are just unitary matrices, and we have x and z. Now, x, if applied on a qubit, performs a flip bit. A, a bit flip, just like the classical uh, one pad. And the Z operator performs a phase shift. Uh, yeah. So now, if we want to apply a quantum on a pad, what we do is we sample a one time key, lowercase x and lowercase z. So we sample two bits. And let's say we apply the quantum on a pad into this arbitrary superposition. Uh, what we do is apply x to the power of x and z to the power of z. So what happens here is that if x equals 0, Nothing happens, uh, the Pauli operator x is not applied, but if x lowercase x equals 1, 
then we apply the operator x and we perform bit flip. The same thing for z, if it's zero net compass, if it's one, we perform the phase shift. And it is proven that the result of this uh, computation is a completely hidden quantum state, statistically hidden. And of course, you can only confirm back if you know the 110 keys, if you know x and z. Now, uh, using this uh, quantum at the pad, <coughs> uh, there have been some constructions of quantum at the team. Uh, there was also one from Burkeski in the same year, but I'm going to focus on the one from Mahadev, uh, because this is the one we're also going to use. And the main idea here is that you can use a hybrid ciphertext. The ciphertext is a hybrid form that has both the quantum part and the classical part. So if we have a message psi, the client sends the quantum one time padded state of the message along with the encryption of the one time keys using a full homomorphic encryption scheme. And then she shows a way on how to apply quantum computations on the one time padded states. So here we apply the under U that are dependent on the classical homomorphic computations of the keys. So <clears throat> We say we send this uh, hybrid ciphertext that has the quantum and padded state uh, along with the encryption of the keys, and then the server performs quantum computations. Now the keys change, but he also updates the keys. Uh, I'm going to repeat this again uh, one more time in the slide. So what we do is perform classical homomorphic computations on the uh, classical keys along with dependent quantum computations. So let's say we apply unitary U and this is our original message. Now the quantum and state is still a quantum and padded state of the evaluated message, but the keys are different, but they're uh, simultaneously updated under encryption. And thus, uh, in the end, when we get the last message, we can to crypt, use the classical encryption, get the classical keys, one time keys, and use it to get our evaluated message. Now, uh, just to get um, a bit of intuition, in order to do this transformation uh, and have a full homework encryption scheme, we want a universal set of gates. And one uh, universal set is Clifford gates along with the Toffoli gate. Now, the Clifford gates are the easy case because the Clifford gates, uh, they preserve the Pauli matrices by conjugation. So if we apply a Clifford gate, if this unit is a Clifford gate, then the, the structure looks the same. Uh, after like from implementation and uh, just the keys are different, but you it's trivial to also update the keys. Now the problem is with the Toffel gate where uh, the case is not the same, and <clears throat> at some point we would have to perform a quantum operation dependent on the classical encrypted keys. Of course, this is not trivial at all, and the results are interesting, but, but I'm not going to get into details. What I'm going to say is that Mahadev showed that if you have a classical FAT scheme with certain properties, specific properties, then you can use that to do this computation here, and thus you can use it to evaluate quantum circuits. And a classical FHC with set properties is called a quantum capable FHC scheme. Now, um, so uh, in our constructions, uh, what we need and the properties of interest to us are that the scheme has this hybrid ciphertext consisting of the quantum part, which is our quantum untempered methods, and the classical part, which is a classical encryption of the classical, again, one-time keys of the quantum antipod state. And we also uh, use that the classical component of the ciphertext, so the classical FAT, satisfies semi-honest circuit privacy. And by using these properties, and actually for any quantum FAT with these properties, we have a result uh, that I also mentioned earlier. So we... Uh, Leave the protocol from semi-honest security to maliciously circuit private security. 
and we also uh, construct a rate one quantum mobility. Now, in this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the rate one part. And uh, to begin with, I'm going to let's take a look at the rate of existing quantum efficiency protocols. For example, in the Mahadi scheme, if you remember, the rate was the message ciphertext or the, the evaluated message in plane over the homework evaluated message. Now, uh, the actual message is just all qubits, uh, but the homework evaluated message, if you remember, we have the quantum part, which is still all qubits because the quantum on time pad doesn't introduce any more size, plus the size of the classical keys, of the homework evaluated classical keys. And now um, this definition of rate looks looks a bit weird because uh, we combine both qubits and bits, but this is fine because basically both qubits and bits are the most basic unit of info in their corresponding setting. And yeah, so this is a rate of a quantum FHC scheme right now. Um, but the classical FHC that we use, it's not rate one, actually it blows up the ciphertext by a polynomial factor. And thus, the overall rate is very low, we have inverse polynomial rate. And we aim to uh, increase that. Uh, before getting into the construction again, um, I want to focus on the failed approach to get some more intuition. Uh, so the quantum uh, the quantum part we cannot make them smaller it's already optimal so we, we have to shrink the class confirmation and one idea is to use a pseudo random generator now a pseudo random generator is well a generator well if you put a small string which is called the seed you get a seemingly um, random string, bigger string. And the idea here is that instead of storing the whole one ten key, you just hold the seed that if you input it to the pseudo random generator, you get the whole one time key. Which is the one time key for many qubits, right? And that seems like a great idea at first because this is how it would look and instead of here storing the like the one time key would be the pseudo random generator of the seed and then here you would just store the seed. But the problem is that even after one homework evaluation, if you remember, the one time key changes. So we have a new one time key. And this new one time key might exist outside the support of the pseudo random generator. Or even if it was in the support of the generator, we're not sure how to be able to update the seed and then still store the seed. So this fails and seems like we're stuck with an encryption of classical encryption of the one time key that looks like this. And if you think about it, we need two classical bits to encrypt one qubit. So it seems like we're really stuck. Now, uh, the solution is... Um, uh, for the solution, we have to consider these spooky interactions. And so there are some uh, FHC schemes that pack K classical bits into ciphertext of these four. So we have the ciphertext that has a vector C0 and then one bit for its uh, classical uh, bit uh, from plain text. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that these last key bits are non locally correlated with the secret key, and that means that we can use some spooky decryption that sounds cool uh, that by using a function f that's relevant for us right now, we think put this first part of the ciphertext is zero, which is first small part of the ciphertext. If we XOR that with the last k bits, we get uh, the actual decryption. Uh, and in this paper, uh, by using spoke interactions, they were able to uh, construct this rate one FET that I mentioned earlier. Now, in our construction, what we do is we use this spook encryption scheme to get a rate one form. And how do we do that? So, uh, in the original protocol, we have 
We have to have a quantum capable of it C. And when we want to store the information, we key switch to the rate one of it C. And I'm going to show you exactly how we get this rate one form. And then if we want to uh, continue doing homomorphic relations, we can uh, switch back. So basically, we, we use both of these schemes. Now, here's the main idea. So uh, the first thing we do is convert from the classical, uh, from the quantum capable FAT scheme to this spooky um, scheme that looks like this. If you remember, we have a vector C0, and then we have one bit for its one time key bit, right? And then the main idea is that we take, <coughs> we say, store the first part of the ciphertext, this uh, vector C0, and then we incorporate all of this bits into the quantum untamed path. So by doing this, what happens is that by incorporating them into the quantum untamed path, we change the one time key. So if we consider one qubit uh, that had a one time key x and z, now the one time key is altered and we have x x short with cx and z x short with cz. <coughs> but uh, that's not a problem because if you remember the spooky decryption equal to this function f xored with the last bits of the ciphertext. Now, if we solve for the function f, we get the decryption xored again with the last bit of the ciphertext, but the decryption is the original one time key. And then xored with the last bit of the ciphertext, we have this exactly the updated one time key that we created by incorporating these bits into the original quantum one thing by itself. So I don't know if this got a bit too technical, but the main idea here is that, is that we get this spooky form and we have the ciphertext that's in two parts. We just store this first part, this vector C0, which is uh, very small, and then the rest of the bits, we incorporate them into the quantum mountain pad, and then by just using the function f, we can get the new updated keys, just by storing this small part of the ciphertext. Now, if we take a look at the rate of this uh, construction, of course, the message was L qubits. Let's say we have an L qubit state. Now, in the compressed evaluated ciphertext, the quantum uh, information is still L qubits, but the classical information is just this vector C0. So if we calculate the rate, it looks a bit like this. And uh, if we set the parameters accordingly, uh, and we have L that's uh, big enough, we can get rate asymptotically equal to 1, just by assuming polynomial modulus noise rate, so LWB. Uh, great. So now this is uh, the main construction of our protocol. Um, <clears throat> And it is a generic approach because it works for any quantum FHC with these properties that I talked about. And what we do, again, to sum it up, is we have the quantum capable FHC, and we also have the rate 1 FHC, and we key switch from one to the other to store it, and then we can switch back to perform more computations. Uh, so uh, in the full version of the paper, we also have another approach, a non-generic approach, which... Uh, was built specif specifically on the Mahadev scheme, in which instead of having two FHC and key switching from one to the other, we construct uh, a different classical FHC scheme that is both quantum capable and rate one. So this scheme again uses these uh, spooky properties, and we have to prove that it's both quantum capable, and we also have to prove that it is rate one. But uh, the idea is essentially the same, but instead of key switching from one scheme to the other, we combine the best of both worlds and we get one scheme that does both. And that's basically it. <clears throat> I'm going to sum up the results one last time. So again, when we construct this paper, it's a maliciously circuit private ray on quantum FHC. So by assuming a quantum FHC with this hybrid ciphertext form, we first leave the protocol to 
malicious circuit privacy, and then we also get optimal communication complexity constructed with rate one quantum KZ. Uh, here we have the link to the full version of the paper if you want to check it out for more details. And um, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you and uh, bye bye.